In today's lesson, we want to look at how LEC will account for a lease contract. We know that when there's a lease contract, there are two parties involved, LEC and LSO. So in this lesson, our focus is going to be on how LEC will account for a lease, a lease contract in the financial statement of LEC. Don't forget the treatment and how LEC will account for a lease contract is still enshrined in IFRO 16, which has to do with leases. We've already had an introduction aspect of leases. We've already looked at the um, definition of leases, which contracts contain a lease and which contracts do not contain a lease, how to separate a contract into a lease component and a non-lease component. We also look at what is a lease term. We've looked at all those at the introductory aspect of um, leases. So if you've not had a chance to, I mean, have those knowledge, kindly watch um, the channel you have the video there. Please do not forget to share with others, subscribe so that we can increase our um, learning community. So our focus is on how to, how LEC can account for a lease contract. So we are looking at LEC accounting. You see accounting. Now, when it comes to the accounting of leases in the perspective of the leasee, the leasee is always required to account for two things. Generally, the leasee is always required to account for two things. And these are, the leasee is required to account for what we call a lease liability. A lease liability a lease liability and also what we call the right of use asset right of use asset so bear in mind anytime there is a lease contract the lease is required to do four things the first is that the lease is supposed to recognize what we call a lease liability and also recognize what we call a right of use asset the lease must recognize these two things they are mutually exclusive not one all of them the two why when there is a lease contract it's a lease contract over here is a lease contract now the leasee he will be required to make some periodic payments which we call the lease payments now assuming this lease contract is going to take a lease term of three years a lease term of three years Let's forget about when the payment is done, either in advance or at the end of the period. Let's forget about that one for now. So the lease contract has a lease term of three years. Now, if we assume that the leasee is required to pay a periodic payment of $60,000 for the three years, if that happens, then leasee will pay 60000 in year one, will pay 60,000 in year two and the same in year three. Now we are at our commencement date. We've looked at what is the commencement date in our introduction aspects. So you will not, you don't, you not watch that video, you can kindly go to the channel and watch the definition for commencement date. At the commencement date, Lisi wouldn't have paid any of this amount. So this amount which is yet to be paid over the next three years, this amount are liabilities to the receipt. So, since this amount have not been paid at the initial date of the contract or at the date on which the lessor provides the assets to the lessee, those amounts will be paid. So, the lessee must account for amounts which are yet to be paid, such as the lease payment, which are yet to be paid as what? Well, as a lease liability. Do not forget also that the contract comes with an underlining asset. We've also looked at what's an underlining asset in our introductory um, lesson. So the lessor will provide to the lessee an underlining asset, and that asset will be in the books of the lessee. Most that's what I'm saying generally, most cases. The assets will be in the books of what of the or be in the premises of the lessee. And for that matter, 
then the C must account for what you call right of use assets. So see this right of use asset as the asset itself, like the entity has purchased the asset itself, and see the lease liability as the lease payment, the amount yet to be paid to the lessor. Generally, any time there is a lease contract, the lessee must account for two things generally. And these are a lease liability and a right of use asset. Exception. 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 Exception to this general statement. Exception. The lessee is allowed or is exempted from recognizing a lease liability and a right of use asset when there are two things or there are two, in fact, there are two, but if any one of them, they are not mutually exclusive, any one of them is happening in the lease contract. And that is if the lease is of a short term, the lease is of a short term, of a short term. This short term we are looking at is 12 months or less. 12 months or less. So the lease, if the lease is of a short term or the lease for which, lease for which, lease for which the underlying asset, the underlying asset is of a low value is of a low value a low value so we are saying that under normal circumstances when there is a lease contract the lessee must recognize a lease liability and a right of use asset but there is the exception if the lease contracts we are considering in the question is having a lease term which is about 12 months or less then the lessee must not come here. The lessee must not come here. The lessee will account for that lease using different approach. I will talk about it in a moment. And also, if the underlying asset for which the lease contract was signed or was undertaken is of a low value, then we are saying that the lessee will not account for the lease as a lease liability and right of lease assets. So I'm reiterating what I'm saying. Let me explain. So this is when the lease is of a short term. The lease is of a short term means that the lease is having 12 month duration or the lease term is 12 months or less. Like say six months, if you lease an asset for six months, eight months, which is less than the 12 months, then we are saying that you don't have, the EC must not account for a lease liability or a lease, um, a right of lease asset. Please take note. These two are not mutually exclusive. Even if one of them is present in the lease contract, then the lessee is exempted from applying the right of use asset. So when you're talking about a lease for which the underlying asset is of a low value, the standard is going to describe what is a low value in this case. But they give, they give an example of assets such as maybe um, small office, um, Computer, you are also looking at tablets. In some books, they state that the lowest value is um, five thousand dollars. But you know, when it comes to other parts of the world, five thousand dollars is a huge sum of money. So the standard itself did not describe any amount to be considered as a low value. Bear in mind that when we are talking about a low value of an asset, we are not talking about the carried amount of the asset. So don't we don't consider the carried amount of a vehicle. As a low value, we have to consider the amount when the asset was initially acquired. So even if the asset has been used before it is being leased out and is having a low value, we don't consider that. We consider the original amount of the lease asset, the underlying assets in the question. So anytime the lease is of a short value or it's of, sorry, of a short term or the underlying asset is of a low value, then the lessee must account for lease using what we call a straight line basis. Using what we call straight line basis. Must account for that one. what we call straight line basis or any systematic basis that is more um, prudent and applicable than if it is more than the straight line basis. So the LC is allowed 
to use the straight line basis when the means falls within this category. How do we apply this straight line basis? It means that the lease payment inherent in the lease must be paid equally over the life of the asset. Somebody will say, why am I saying life of the asset? We are talking about short term, which is more than, less than 12 months. Please, we can have a contract which will be a low value, but it can be leased for three years. So assuming that we have a lease asset, which is of a short value, and the payment is, let's say, $100 for year one, $100 let's say $150 for year two, and then um, another $150 for year three. What the standard is saying is that the LEC will account for such a lease on a straight line basis. That means that you will sum up all these three, get giving us $400 and divide it by three. Then we will take the yearly expenses to our P or L account. So, Year one, after dividing 400 by three, whatever we get, year one will be taken to the profit or loss account as an expense. Year two will be taken to the profit or loss account as an expense. However, if the lease is of a short term, then that means it's even within a year. So within that accounting period in which the lease term falls, we are going to treat all that lease payment as, as an expense in the profit or loss account of the LEC. So, for instance, assuming that we've rented or we've leased an asset, that the lease um, payment is going to be, let's say, five thousand dollars, but this is of a short term; it's of for just eight months, and it's it's occurring between the period of first of January, twenty twenty, to maybe the first of January, the first of December, twenty twenty. That means you account for this. 5,000 lease payment as an expense in the profit or loss in the period from 1st of January 2020 to 31st of December 2020. So take note of the way LEC must recognize a lease contract. <coughs> so in summary, we are saying that LEC, generally LEC must account for the lease liability or the right of use asset when there is a lease contract. The exception is that if the lease contract in question is of a short term or the assets in the lease contract and the lining asset is of a low value, then the leasee is exempted from recognizing a lease liability and a right of use asset. Now let's look at how to measure the right of use asset and a lease liability. We want to look at how to measure the lease liability and the right of use asset. We will look at the initial measurement and a subsequent measurement. Remember that I indicated in our introductory video that when it comes to a lease contract, we have three things to do. How to account for the lease in the perspective of a lease. You see, in the perspective of the lease and then sale and lease back. These two things, once we are able to cover all, then we are done with the lease, lease, or we are done with the IFRS 16 called leases. So we want to first look at the initial measurement of Initial measurement measurement of a lease liability. You want to first take a lease liability. A lease liability. So if the LC is going to recognize a lease liability, what amount should the LC initially place on that lease liability? The initial measurement of our lease liability. So take note. Initially, the LC is supposed to measure the lease liability as the present value. So the lease, the lease is going to measure the initial amount of the lease liability as the present value of all lease payments that are not paid on the commencement date. This is very, very important. Very, very, very important. These statements I'm making. Because it will help you when the lease or when the lease is, in fact, when the lease payment is in arrears or is paid in advance or at the beginning. So please take note of these crucial statements. So we are saying that initially, the lease must measure the lease liability at the present value of all lease payments. So the present value of all lease payments. All lease payments 
that are not paid at the commencement date. Please take note of this statement. That are not paid at the commencement date. That means any amount that have already been paid before or on the commencement date shall not be counted or shall not be part of the lease liability. Any amount that have been paid on or before the commencement date shall not be a part of your lease liability. So we are saying that initially LEC must account for the lease liability or must measure the lease liability at the present value of all lease payments. We are yet to look at what constitutes lease payment. All right, all lease payments that are not made at the commencement date. This is the present value, so we need an interest rate to be used in the computation or in determining our present value. So the interest rate to be used in determining the present value of the lease is the interest rate implicit in the lease. Is the interest rate implicit in the lease? Not any other interest rate, but the interest rate that is implicit in the lease. If this interest rate is not determinable, then you will go for the lease incremental borrowing rate. Incremental borrowing rate. Incremental borrowing rate. So the interest rate at which an entity will pay interest on a borrowed amount, that is the incremental borrowing rate. Please take note. In a situation or in a question where we have the implicit, the interest rate implicit in the lease in the question and the incremental borrowing rate of the lease, they are both in the question. Please, we will use the first one. The first one is having uh, you know, authority, is paramount to the second one. So if the two are present in a particular question, we go for the in implicit interest rate or interest rate that is implicit in the lease. Please take notes. Take notes. But if we cannot determine the implicit, we are going to use the incremental borrowing rate of the C. Please, if the interest rate that is implicit in the lease cannot be determined, but it cannot be estimate, estimated, but they just say that, oh, it cannot be estimated, which is supposed to be 12%, but the incremental borrowing rate of the C is 14%, then we will go in for the 14%, because the other one they mentioned said they cannot be determined. They cannot be determined. Please take note. Okay, now let's look at what constitutes a lease payment when it comes to the lease liability. What constitutes a lease payment? Let's look at that. What constitutes a lease payment? In terms of determining the lease liability, what constitutes a lease payment? A lease payment. All right, so the first thing we are going to look at is the fixed lease rental payment. The fixed lease rental payment. Sometimes we are supposed to adjust it with any incentive. So we adjust this payment with any <clears throat> incentive. So the fixed lease rental payment is actually the lease payment that is the lease is going to pay periodically so for instance the scenario i gave earlier on the sixty thousand, the lease is going to pay over the lease term of three years that sixty thousand is going to be the same for year one year two and then year three that's why it's being referred to as fixed lease rental payment this was one of the lease payments but please take note take note of the statement here Take note because this is lease payment that have not been paid. So this fixed rental payment is a payment that have not been paid on or at all before the commencement date. Please, I'm making this statement because of what we call some of these lease payments are paid in advance and are paid in arrears. If the lease payment is paid in advance, there is a way to treat the first payment because the first payment is paid out of that means first on the commencement date it has been paid already so that wouldn't form part of this lease payment but i will talk extensively on that 
going forward. The second one has to do with a lease, in fact, variable, variable lease payment, variable lease payment. That depends on that depends on variable lease payment. That depends on an index, an index or a REIT. So there are some lease payments that are variable in nature, and they are variable in nature depends on an index or a REIT. So for instance, you can say that the first lease payment is sixty thousand. But when you go to year two, there is going to be a change in this list payment, which is going to be dependent on an index. Let's say the index at the commencement date is one, two, five, and the index at the reporting date is one, three, eight. This is the commencement date index. This is the reporting date index. When that happens, the year two, the year two payment is going to differ. Why? Because is going to vary from the year one. That is why we say it's a variable lease payment, but this change in the lease payment is dependent on a lease, in fact, an index or a rate. So how to determine the year two will probably be the reporting date index, which is one, three, eight, divided by the, the commencement date index. So the reporting date index divided by the uh, commencement date Index, then we multiply it by the amount in question, which is the 60,000. This will give us the year two um, lease payment, which is going to be variable. Now, this variable um, lease payment brings about the measurement of our lease, uh, our lease, sorry, in fact, our lease liability. Okay? The, Variable lease payment bring changes to how we value our lease liability because this 60,000 will run through from year one to the year three of our lease term. But remember that the variable, the addition of the uh, variable lease payment or the additional lease payment as a result of the variable lease payment should also be accounted for, which will affect our measurement or our carried amount of our lease liability. And we will look at this when we are looking at how to re-measure or how to reassess our lease liability. So don't forget, variable lease payment is the second item that forms or that constitutes your lease liability. Okay, so the next <coughs> item that constitutes our lease payment has to do with amount expected to be payable. So amount expected to be payable, expected to be payable, Better to be payable under receivable value guarantee. So under receivable receivable value guarantee. So the third item that constitutes our lease liability is the amount which is expected to be payable, and this amount is expected to be payable under receivable value guarantee. Sometimes we have Amount that are expected to be payable, which are not, they are under on, they are under residual value on guarantee, but this one are guaranteed residual value. What does it mean? This is when a party which is unrelated to the lease or a third party which is unrelated, unrelated to the lease or can be related to the lease promises the lease that at the end of the lease term, the value of the underlying asset will be so so and so amount. That is what we are looking at as an amount expected to be payable under residual value guarantee. The amount that an unrelated party to the lease will promises or will promise the lease that at the end of the lease contract or in the lease term, they are, that amount of the underlying asset will now be so so and so amount. Let's say. You are looking at at the end, you are going to the value of your asset is going to be five thousand. This amount is what we call amount expected to be payable under receivable value guarantee. Please do not forget that this amount is always treated as the last year figure because of this present value. We are going to discount them, so this amount should always be treated as the last year, the last 
term, the last lease term, okay, the last lease term. So we are looking at five years. The, the fifth year is when this amount will be captured. So that is with the amount expected to be payable and that receivable value guarantee. Now the the fourth one has to do with excise price, the excise price, the excise price of a purchase option, the excise price of a purchase option. If the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that option, if the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that option, so this is when there is this agreement that at the end of the lease contract, the lessee will buy the asset. That amount that the lessee is going to pay to buy the asset is what we are looking at as a size price. This is an option because it's a contract today of which it will be executed in the future. That is why they are giving it a size price. Any time the an option is executed in the future, that price of which it is determined today is known as a size price. So that a size price of purchase option but remember that this is only when it is reasonably certain that the lessee will exercise this option. So you have to look at the facts and circumstances of the contract to see if the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that purchase option. If that happens, this amount will also constitute the lease liability. And then the last item is going to be what we call termination penalty. Termination penalty. Assuming, remember what is a lease, you said that it's a contract, so any contract comes with an enforceable right and enforceable obligation. In fact, I indicated in our introduction that what is enforceable right and what is an enforceable obligation is a matter of law, which is dependent on or which is um, jurisdiction specific. So in this case, if the LEC, I mean, terminates the contract, in fact, fails to fulfill this side of the contract and terminate the contract, the LEC might be required to make some payment which is termination penalty that if it's in the question must also constitute the initial measurement of your lease liability please take note in some questions they will give it to you they will tell you that the present value of all lease payments is hundred thousand dollars that means they have already given you the lease liability. you don't have to go through this stress you don't have to go and look for all this yours is to look for the value the initial value of the right of use as mean indicated that the EC must initially account or must recognize a lease liability and a right of use asset. So we are now done with the initial measurement or initial value, how to determine the initial value of the lease liability. We are moving to the right of use asset. Then I will tell you about the implications of when the payment is done in arrears and when the payment is done in advance. Please take note that Initially, LEC must account or must measure a lease liability at by the present value of the lease payment that are not paid at the commencement date. At the commencement date, can you take note of that? So we want to look at initial measurement of the right of use assets. Right of use assets. Now at the initial day or the commencement date, the LEC is supposed to initially measure a right of use asset using what we call or is supposed to measure the right of use asset at cost. At cost. So we measure the right of use asset at cost. But this cost here is different from the cost we have looked at under intangible assets, under property, plant and equipment, and under investment property. So this how to determine the cost here is different. Now, what constitutes the cost of a right of use asset? What constitutes the cost of a right of use asset? One, the first one is the lease payment. In fact, the fixed lease payment, the fixed lease payment that are paid at or before, please take note of that are paid at or before the commencement date. So, the commencement date. I'm stressing on this because it's very important. The lease payments that are paid at or before the commencement date, please, we take into consideration any, if there is any incentive, we will take them away, we will less them. So if there is any incentive provided by the lease or to the lease, the same thing applies in the determination of the lease liability. The same thing applies in the determination of the lease liability. 
Now, let me bring in the lease payment paid in arrears and lease payment paid in advance. So in arrears and in advance. Okay. If the lease payments are paid in advance and you want to determine the present value of your lease, remember that we said the lease payments are paid, any lease payments that are paid at all on this before the commencement date forms part of the initial measurement of your right of use assets. So, assuming that our lease term is five years, our lease term is five years. Now, for you to determine your present value, the present value, let's say year one, we will take a practical question. So, we have our year one year. So, let me bring year one, year two, year three, year four over here, and then year five. Assuming the lease term is five years. Then, we need to discount them. This will be our cash flow. We need to discount, let's say our cash flow, flow is 100, 100, 100, 100 dollars throughout the fifth year. Now we need our discounting factor. We need our discounting factor here, which is, don't forget, which is one divided by one plus R. One plus R, always the power N. So the R here is our interest rate implicit in the lease, or if it's not determinable, then we go for the incremental borrowing rate, incremental borrowing rate of the DC. And the N here is the number of years. So when we are here, this, this will take one. If you are here, this will take two years. If you are here, this will take three years. Now, if the lease payment is in arrears, then we don't have any issue with this one. When the lease payment is in arrears and you want to determine the lease liability, then you don't have any issues with this one. But if the lease payment is in advance or is at the beginning of the period, then when you are determining your lease liability, you have to exclude the last year or you can include the last year but you will start from year two why because the first lease payment have been paid it will surface here that one 100 will be here because they said a lease payment at or before so that's first day of the commencement date lease payment have already been paid and lease liability is amount that are yet to be paid so that amount must not be part of your lease liability so it has been captured here which is the hundred so you are if you are determining your lease liability that amount will not be part because of the clause that the lease payment is paid in advance. It's paid at the beginning of the period. When that happens, that lease payment will not be part of the, the first payment will not be part of this payment, will not be part of the lease liability. It will surface here because of this statement. Lease payment at or before the commencement date, please take note. So this is the, this is where you have to be vigilant as to how the lease payment is paid and then uh, whether it's paid in advance or in arrears. If it is paid in advance, then remember that if it's five years, then you calculate for lease payment for four years. If it's three years, two years. That one payment will surface at the determination of the right of use asset. If it is in arrears, you don't have any issue. You don't have any issue. Now, if you are starting from um year two don't say that because you are starting from year two then your discounting factor is going to be one divided by one plus r always to the power two no you will still start from one because at the end of the day we want to get one remember that with this discounting factor we can also use the annuity the present value of an annuity if the payments are the same we can use the present value of an annuity which say that i use the present value of our annuity when the payment the annual payments are the same or the periodic payments are the same. In this case, we are saying that your periodic payments should all be multiplied by one minus one divided by one plus R or raised to the power N. All these should be divided by your R. So this will give you, this is the present value of an ordinary annuity formula. If it's annuity due, then we would have multiplied it by one plus R if it's annuity due, but this is for Ordinary annuity, annuity in our arrears. This is when it is in arrears. If it had to be in advance, then we would have added one, but we don't need this one. This is what we need. So if the payment are this, instead of going by the table, you can also go by this formula. Any of them will give you the same answer. So this is the first thing for that constitutes the cost. The second one is any direct cost, any direct cost related to the lease. Okay, any direct cost that is directly related to so, indirect correlated to the lease 
the lease, which was incurred by the lease. So any direct cost incurred by the lease and is related to the lease contract will also be captured here. Will also be captured here. Then we want to also look at um, dismantling cost. Dismantling cost. So if the assets will be installed or the asset will be will take a substantial period of time and for that matter at the end of the list term it must be removed the uh, states that the asset was installed must be reinstated to its previous or its original state that amount that you incurred in dismantling the assets is a future cost so you have to take into consideration time value of money by discounting that future in case there is an effective interest rate in the question that dismantling cost must also be part of the right of use assets. It can be part of your right of use assets. So these are, or this is the way we account for the right of use assets. How do we measure, sorry, how we initially measure the right of use assets and how we initially measure our lease liability. The next thing we are supposed to look at is our subsequent measurement. How do we subsequently measure our lease liability and how do we subsequently measure our right of use assets okay so let's first look at the subsequent measurement of subsequent measurement of our right of use assets let's first look at how to subsequently measure our right of use assets assets now the standards say that subsequently a right of use assets can be measured using what we call the cost model the cost model, the cost model, the cost model, the cost model. So we can use the cost model to subsequently measure the right of use assets. And remember that when we are using the cost model under IEA 16, it is barely the cost of the asset, the cost of the asset minus accumulated um, depreciation. And if there is any accumulated impairment, you also less that one. So we apply that here to determine the carried amount of the assets. So Subsequently, we depreciate the assets. That is, we use the cost model. But the standard also says that if the right of use asset, or in fact the lease asset, falls within the category of an investment property, or falls within a revaluation model under IES 16, then we apply those models as well. So if the lease method meets the definition of investment property, then we go to IES 40 and account for that right of use asset as such. It falls or it's missing the recognition in revaluations of loss. Okay, so revaluation model, then we apply the revaluation model as well. And remember that each treatment will be different. Revaluations of losses will go to other comprehensive income. And in the exception that there is no previously recognized revaluation loss. And revaluation losses will also go to the profit or loss account in with the idea that there is no recognized, there is no initial or previously recognized revaluations of loss in the other comprehensive income. So remember that if the lease asset, they generally, we are going to use the cost model. But if the lease asset is within investment property, then we apply investment property. Now, which years are we going to use to depreciate in case we are using the cost model? Which year are we going to use? The standard says that if the lessee is going to purchase the asset at the end of the lease term, then we are going to use the useful life of the asset. The useful life of the asset. So if the EC will purchase the asset at the end of the listing, then we are going to use the useful life of the asset. If that exercise or that is not going to be exercised at the end of the lease term, the EC is not going to buy or purchase the lease asset at the end of the lease term, then the standard requires that we consider the useful life of the asset the useful life of the assets and also the lease term, which of them is shorter. So the lease term, which of them is shorter, will be used to use that years as the years to depreciate your initial value of the right of use asset because initially you have determined it. Initially you have determined it. Uh -huh. Please, the initial measurement, the initial measurement, I think I've jumped one thing. The initial measurement, I've jumped one thing. When it comes to the right of use assets, the initial measurement always include the initial amount of the lease liability. Initial amount of the lease liability. Initial amount of the lease liability. Please take notes. Please take notes. 
initial amount of the lease liability. So when you are talking about the initial measurement of our right of lease asset, which I said is the cost, which I said is the cost, then we are saying that it is our initial value of the lease liability. So whatever value you have computed for your lease liability initially will be part of the cost of your right of use assets. So it comes first. So sorry about that. So initial value of the lease liability, then we will come to the lease payment, the lease fees payment. Then we will not come to any directly cost or any direct cost incurred by the lease, which is related to the contract or the lease contract, and then dismantling or removal cost, dismantling or removal cost. Those costs are what goes into what the determination of the initial value of the lease liability. Please don't forget the initial value of the lease liability is part of the initial cost of the lease or in part of the right of use assets. Take me. Sorry for that uh, uh, omission. Sorry for that omission. So I'm saying that if you are going to subsequently use the cost model, then we are saying that the if the asset will be acquired at the end of the lease term, then we use the useful life. If not, you look at which one is the shorter. So if you look at this, if the lease term is shorter than the useful life, then we use that to depreciate the um the cost. If the useful life is the one that is shorter, then we use that one. But I wonder where a useful life of an asset, in fact, the lease term will be longer than the useful life of an asset. I wonder if, where we will have the contract where the um useful life of the assets will be shorter than the list. So this is how to measure, or this is how to subsequently measure our right of use assets. Please do not forget what I omitted in the initial measurement of our uh, 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 right of use asset, the cost. Remember that the initial value of your lease liability have determined under the lease liability, that amount will be part of your lease payment. It's, sorry, it will be part of your initial value of your right of use asset. So for instance, assuming that there is um, a question where the initial value of our lease liability, so let's say our lease liability is, is um, $60,000, and then we made um, a direct cost, we incurred a direct cost, a direct cost of 5000 Dallas, we also incurred initial payment or initial deposit. Initial deposit. Initial deposits of two thousand dollars. What will be the initial value of your right of use asset? Then we say that it is initially measured at cost, and this cost will comprise all that is on the board. So the lease liability is one. We sum it to the direct cost. We sum it to this. So our initial value of the right of use asset is going to be um, sixty-seven thousand dollars. Sixty-seven thousand dollars. So please take note of that omissions earlier in the determination of the initial value of the right of use asset. The lease liability, the initial value of the lease liability, forms part of the initial measurement of the right of use asset. Take note. Uh, so now let's look at the subsequent measurement of subsequent measurement of our lease liability. Okay, so subsequent measurement of our lease liability. Lease liability. So subsequently, our lease liabilities will be amortized. Will be amortized. So you increase the carried amount of the lease liability by the interest rate and you will decrease the carried amount of the lease liability by the lease payment. So one is increasing it and one is reducing it. And we have to subsequently what? Amortize. We subsequently amortize our lease liability. And this amortization depends on whether the lease payment is in advance or the lease payment is in arrears. The lease payment is in advance or the lease payment is in advance. Uh, is in arrears. So let's first take a situation where the lease payment is in arrears. So our subsequent measure, which is going to be our amortization schedule, amortization schedule, or some will say schedule, schedule when it is in arrears. So when the lease is in arrears. Okay, then we are going to have our dates. We are going to have our dates here. Our dates on, in, in fact, yes, 
and then we have our opening value opening value then we have our finance cost finance cost which is the interest finance cost so this one we are going to use the interest rate that is implicit in the in the lease or the lc incremental borrowing rate then this is going to be our lease payment the periodic lease payment we are we are making so lease payment lease payment and then the final figure here is going to be our closing balance closing balance closing balance so this is what we are going to send to our so let's say this year one year two and then year three i'm just going to write some figures for understanding six so let's say our initial measurement of the lease liability is um hundred thousand dollars so our interest rate is ten percent so ten percent on this will give us ten thousand and then remember this in arrears and then our lease payment let's say our lease payment is twenty thousand each period so we always less the lease payment so we less this if we add this and less we are going to get ninety thousand so if we come here the new value will be ninety thousand we multiply it by the ten we get nine thousand we are still going to less twenty thousand from this this is going to be ninety nine thousand minus twenty thousand which is going to give us seventy nine thousand dollars now these figures will go to statement of financial position so i'm teaching presentation as well how to present um a lease um liability as well as the right of use assets remember that let me just talk about the right of use assets the carried amount will go to the statement of financial position as a separate line item so we have to see the lease assets then we have it there the carried amount will be there then the lease liability also go to the the liability aspect of the statement of financial position but remember that you split this into a non-parent liability and then current liability I will teach you how to do that in a different so the this cost this one will go to your profit or loss account as an expense this cost will go to profit or loss account as an expense this is the treatment all right now how do we split the closing balances when it is in arrears when it's in arrears is different from when it is in advance how do you split it now for us to split this value here between um non-current liability and then current liability then we have to first determine the current liability how do we determine the current liability we determine the current liability by going to the next period the next period then find the difference between our payment our lease payment and our finance cost so our lease payment here is twenty thousand is twenty thousand dollars and then our finance cost is nine thousand we take it away so once you've done that you get eleven thousand uh, dollars this becomes your current liability then we take the eleven thousand from this to get our non-current liability so there is going to be the ninety thousand minus our current liability of eleven thousand this will give you your non-current liability please this approach is only applicable when the lease payment is in arrears when the lease payment is in arrears if the lease payment is in advance it will take a different approach it will take a different treatment to get the current liability and the non-current liabilities so i'm going over again so is the next you go to the next if you want to get the current non-current asset and current uh, sorry non-current liability and the current liability you go to the next year take the payment the lease payment the periodic payment twenty thousand and take away the finance cost from it once you've done that you get what we call the current liability now take the current liability from our total um closely balance of the lease payment the lease payment and but the lease liability the lease this is going to be the lease liability then we are going to have whatever we get here i think this is going to be Eighty nine thousand, and this is going to be our non current um, lease liability. And if you sum up these two, it should give you the ninety thousand as our closing balance of our lease liability. This is where this is the situation where we are looking at the payment being in arrears. Now let's look at the payment being in advance. When the payment is in advance, then a lot of things will change. A lot of things will change. Some positions will change. So. We are looking at a situation where our payment is in advance when our payment is in advance when our payment is in advance when our lease payment is in advance then we will have our opening balance here then the next thing that will come is going to be um let me clean here the next thing that will come is going to be our 
lease payment. So this one, lease payment will come first because the assumption is that you make payment at the beginning of the period. So your interest should not affect the payment you've already made. So if you are making payment at the beginning of the period, let's take away that payment before we will charge our interest. So this will give us net opening, net opening balance. Net opening balance. Then we cannot charge our finance. We cannot charge our finance costs. Then we cannot get our closing balance. So this is a situation when we are looking at advance, when the payments are in advance. So closing balance. And the payments are in advance. This is the table. It's your opening value. We less our lease payment. Then, then net opening balance. Then we have our finance costs. So let's take another example here. Let's say our opening balance is still 100,000. And our lease payment is still 20,000. Please, anytime it is in advance, the first payment is always dash. The first payment is always dash. That we paid already. So here, it will still be the 100,000. And then our finance cost here, let's say it's 10%. It's going to be 10%. We add it to this. We are going to get 110,000 as our closing balance. Then we go to the next period. This is going to be 110,000 as our opening balance here. Then our periodic payment of 20,000 be less. And then after that, we are going to get 90,000. This way we are going to charge our interest of 10% and it's going to give us 9,000 and it's going to give us 99,000 as our closing balance. As our closing balance. Now, for us to split this as an um, opening and closing, our opening, sorry, our non current and then our current, sorry, our non current liability and current liability. Our current liability is always the lease payment, the lease payment. The lease payment. So if it's in advance, your lease payment is always your liability. The lease payment is always your liability. The lease payment is always your liability. And if it is in, um, then we take it away from the closing to get the non current lease liability. Non current lease liability. Now there are some times where payment will be done within the year. Payment will be done within the year. It can be thrice, it can be twice, it can be maybe four times within the year. Whether it depends on how it is compounding. Now, if that's the case, then we've been giving this our interest rate to be annually. Then we have to divide this interest rate by the number of times the payment is done. So we can make payment twice in a year. So when you come, you have to divide this by two. This applies to when the payment is in arrears. So this is what I'm coming to talk about is both at the arrears and then in advance. So a situation where payment is done twice within the period, then we are saying that the interest rate you must check. If the interest rate is not in line with the number of times it will be paid, maybe six months or maybe um, eight months, then you have to take note that this interest rate must be adjusted to reflect the six months before we can take our finance cost on it. Before we can take our finance cost on it. Please take note. Please take note of that. You can also use the 10 percent, the full year, the way you're done, you only take the month that you are supposed to pay. So take note of when and how the interest rate is done. Now, the last thing under the ISO accounting is about re-measurement. So at the end of every period, at the end of the reporting period, the LEC must reassess the current amount of the lease liability. So you must reassess, or we call it re-measure, re-measure the current amount of a lease liability. The current amount of the lease we have made. at the end of every period, we must assess. Now, there are four basic things that give rise to a change in the lease we have made. The first one is that when there is a change in the lease term, when there's a change in the lease term, that is the first one. The second one is that when the, um, the purchase option, when the purchase option has been changed, so when the purchase option has been changed, then the third one is that when the there is a variable consideration, or sorry, there's a variable lease payment. There's a variable lease payment. When there's a variable lease payment. And then the fourth one is that when there is um the amount expected to be payable, when there's a changing, changes in the amount, amount expected to be payable under receivable value guarantee under receivable value guarantee so under um receivable value 
guarantee when that happens guarantee it so anytime there is a change in this then we need to re-measure the current amount of our lease liability at the end of the period now this variable lease payment is going to the one that depends on index the one that depends on index the one that depends on index i think i've um i have thrown more, some light on this already so let's take it from the listing now when it is a listing this may probably come with a, 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 a revised a revised interest rate okay it may come with a revised interest rate Interesting. But with these two, it might not come with the revised interest rate. So you must use the original interest rate implicit in the lease or the lessee incremental borrowing rate. But with this one, mostly it uses the, the original interest rate implicit in the lease. This one, if it cannot be revised, if you don't have the revised interest rate, which must be the pre tax interest rate, then we can go by the original interest rate implicit in the lease. Implicit in the lease. Now, Let's take note of this list term and then this um, purchase option. Anytime you need to reassess the carried amount, you first have to look at the original carried amount of the assets. So the original carried amount of the lease liability, the original carried amount of the lease liability. And then you measure the new one, then you see if there is any differences. Then if there is any difference, the old one, the original one will be increased by the new um adjustment of the carried amount and remember that this will also affect the initial measurement of our right of use assets the underlying asset because remember that the lease liability forms part of the value of the right of use asset so we need to adjust it so we will take a practical question on that so that we can really understand this principle so there's a practical question on this one the remeasurement where you extensively solve that question to your demand understanding on how to remeasure a lease liability and how to account for them. Now, the last thing you will want to look at under the lease accounting is what we call lease modification. Lease modification. Lease modification. Now, there is a lease modification when two things are happening. When the scope of the contract has changed, and we are looking at when the, um, the lease payment has also changed or has increased. So, the lease payment, two things. So, two things give rise to what we call lease modification the first one has to do with the scope of the contract the scope has to do with the if the underlining asset is changing the underlining asset of the contract is changing and then the lease payment is also i mean increasing then that is we have to do what we call a lease modification now a lease modification should be accounted for as a separate lease the standard says that when there's a lease modification then we should account for it as a separate lease. And we are accounting for it as a separate lease. Then we would have accounted for all that we've done so far from the introduction up to this point. We will account for everything as a separate um, lease. But there's a practical expedient that even though um, there is a lease modification, we will continue to treat that particular lease as part of the original lease. So there's a practical expedient that there can be a lease modification and we will not treat it as a separate lease. We just treat it as an adjustment to the previous lease. That is a practical experience. So the lease, remember that the lease must account for two things generally: lease liability and the right of use asset. Exception is that if the lease is of a short term and the underlying asset is of a low value, then the lease must account for that lease as a straight line basis or on a straight line basis, taking the payment to profit or loss account as an expense. We also look at the initial measurement of the right of use asset which comprises the initial value of the lease liability, any fees payment that have been made at or, or before the commencement date, any directly related costs incurred by the LC, and any dismantling or removal of cost that constitutes the initial value of a lease, uh, sorry, a right of use asset. And the lease liability has to do with the present value of all value that have, or all lease payment that have not been paid at the commencement date. Subsequently, a lease, liability must be amortized but you have to take into consideration whether it is the payment is in advance or the payment is in arrears and also to make sure that how many times the payment is done within the period also don't forget the subsequent measurement of right of use asset which might be what depreciated you have to depreciate it using the useful life if the asset to be purchased at the end of the listing or we use the lower of either the useful life and the listing 
if the asset will not be purchased at the end of the lease term by the EC. Don't forget also about the remeasurement or reassessment of the carrying amount of the lease payment. In fact, the lease liability, the carrying amount of the lease liability. Take note of how to account for that. Anytime there's a remeasurement, you have to reassess the carrying amount of your lease liability, most especially when there is um, this variable payment, when there's the lease payment varies, you have to take note of that. So you will take a particular question and extensively look at that. Now, there is one more thing you are supposed to note. Anytime the amount in the question is avoidable, anytime a lease amount or a lease payment is avoidable cost, it doesn't constitute the measurement, it doesn't take part of the initial measurement of both the lease liability and then the right of use assets. So for instance, let's say that you are going to save costs if you incur so and so amount or if you make so and so profit, it's dependent on something, there is a condition. That means those costs can be avoidable. Any lease payment that is avoidable must not be included. It is only unavoidable lease payments. Avoidable lease payments must not be included in the computation of the lease payment. They can be avoided. For that matter, such costs, when they incur, we treat them in the profit or loss account as an expense as and when they do okay. Please take note. Take note of that. Any other costs that are not captured as part of the right of use asset and the lease liability will be treated as an expense in the profit or loss account. So in our next video, we will look at how the lease of account for lease, and then you also look at the seal and lease back. Thanks for always learning with us. Do not forget to subscribe and share with others so that we can increase the learning community. Thank you.